God calls all of us to holiness. He calls all of us to become wise and mature Christians, capable of freely and fully giving ourselves to Him. A key help in answering that call is spiritual direction. Join us today as we explore the nature and the purpose of spiritual direction with our special guest, Father Boniface Hicks, OSB, author of the new book, Spiritual Direction, A Guide for Sharing the Father's Love. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Strategic Relations at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Michael Hernan. Today we're going to be talking about spiritual direction, and I'm here in our studios uh, with our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, a professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, who holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization, again here at Franciscan University, and our special guest, Father Boniface Hicks. Um, Father's a, a Benedictine a monk at the, uh, the Arch Abbey in La Trobe, uh, it's the St. Vincent uh, Arch Abbey in La Trobe, Pennsylvania, uh, where you serve as the Director of Spiritual Formation. You're also the General Manager of Programming, uh, or General Manager, Programming Manager, and the on-air host of We Are One Body uh, Catholic Radio uh, Program. You're a convert both to Christianity and, obviously, Catholicism, uh, and you are now the co-author of this book that we'll be discussing today, Spiritual Direction, A Guide to Sharing the Father's Love. You wrote this with uh, Father Thomas uh, Aiken? Acklin. Acklin. Um, so welcome to the program again, Father. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, as we look at the season of Lent, uh, this is a, a time for spiritual renewal. This is a time for us to really take stock of our souls and a, uh, go through maybe a spiritual workout of sorts, which I think is a, a little bit of analogy uh, to what a spiritual director might, might offer us. But why don't we start with the basics of what is spiritual direction? Spiritual direction, as we define it in the book, is a one-on-one -on -one relationship between a director and a directee, and the focus of that relationship is on the directee's relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And so, there are a lot of other one-on-one -on -one relationships that do other things, but spiritual direction really focuses on the directee's relationship with God. That's a, a key piece. Having said that, our relationship with God brings in essentially every other aspect in our life, so many other experiences and uh, relationships and other things that are going on in our life can end up in spiritual direction, but we're always bringing that back to the relationship with God. Yeah, and so this is, this is again, uh, an opportunity for us on a one-on-one -on -one basis to go deeper in our faith on a personal, personal way. Um, how would you distinguish this between just going to confession? Well, in going to confession, specifically what's necessary for confession is sin. <laughs> and uh, confessing sin is uh, done in a liturgical manner in confession. Yeah. So confession for, uh, throughout the history of the church has often involved some elements of spiritual direction. When we're manifesting our sin, we're really going into some deep interior places in our soul, or we can be. And a confessor, especially a regular confessor, can have some insight, some guidance, a little bit of direction, and can also receive that sharing with a great amount of love that manifests already in that human relationship, the mercy of God, not to mention then the sacramental aspect of bestowing that absolution on the penitent. Mm -hmm. But conf confession can have an element of spiritual direction, but strictly speaking, confession is a liturgy in which sin is confessed and absolution is received and a penitent is... Uh, just a, a really stupid question, uh, but to maximize the best use of one's time, why not combine the two functions? I confess my sins, but at the same time, I receive direction from a priest, the same guy. And confession and spiritual direction can go very well together. When I do spiritual direction with almost all of my directees, we finish the spiritual direction meeting with, with confession. I see. However, uh, we may want to go to confession in addition to our maybe monthly meeting of spiritual right, direction, right. which lasts for an hour. Oh. Confession may last only for a few minutes. 
Right. Again, there still is an opportunity for some direction to go into confession, and that's a wonderful thing. But in both cases, it has to be one-on-one. -on -one. You can't do group direction. <laughs> that's right. right. Exactly. I mean, then it becomes therapy or maybe a course, right? right. You're teaching a class. That's right. Or preaching or right. a yeah. group okay. discussions, discussions or something right. like that. Yeah, yeah. But this is helpful because I think the world understands the notion of counseling. Yes. You know, which is therapy. And even now, popular, you know, life coaches, you know, who give you motivation, you know. But the, the goal in the case of counseling or life coach is success, basically, you know. Whereas sanctity is the goal in spiritual direction. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, yeah. the, the inseparable link between confession on the one hand and spiritual direction, you know, but keeping them distinct, you know, and yet not separated. That's right. I think is the key because for one thing, I mean, there's the seal of the confessional. And so, Absolutely. you know, if you're talking about a whole range of things in spiritual direction, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to keep that distinct, I had imagined. Yeah. You know, I've got two sons in the seminary preparing for the priesthood, and I, yeah. I pray for them regularly for that kind of prudential judgment, you know. Right. Yeah. But I think the more you can keep those distinct, you know, and yet not separate, I think right. the better off we are. And there should be a strong confidentiality and spiritual direction That's as true. well. The seal Quite of confession so. is something absolute and, and to a certain yeah. extreme, but still in spiritual direction, a critical component of it is the kind of trust that comes also in knowing that there's a confidentiality. That's and a good right, point. Right. Yes. And, and also just to draw the distinction that in I, I'm biased towards having a priest who allows for both uh, spiritual direction and confession, but you can have a, a religious sister or even a lay person who might be offering spiritual direction, which then <laughs> a confession is not possible. And, uh, and one of the original expressions of spiritual direction in the church was from the Desert Fathers who were mm. laymen, who were not priests. And yeah. Pope Francis actually makes that, has made that point on several occasions that uh, a, a, a lay person can give spiritual direction. He was addressing some religious sisters in particular who sometimes have some difficulties with priests because they don't fully understand the religious life. Yeah. And wow. someone who understands the religious life, like a religious sister, may be a better spiritual director while the sister could still and should still obviously confess her sins to a priest and receive that grace of absolution. Yeah. But, but the Holy Father emphasized, yeah, that spiritual direction is, an, is originally a lay ministry, but it does go very nicely together with priestly ministry and the formation, the spiritual formation of priests also makes them especially adept at spiritual direction. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Is there a built-in bias uh, that, that uh, manifests itself in, in gender? that really a woman should probably get direction from another woman? Mm. Or is that superficial? Uh, I, I think it's mixed. Some, some women certainly appreciate that, uh, but I have a number of female directees, religious sisters, lay women, single, married, and some of them really appreciate the, the priestly office and understand the fatherly role. So the, the, the father figure plays, it, uh, it's its own unique role in, in spiritual direction. Yeah, I will speak on mm. behalf of my wife, and she definitely prefers a spiritual father. She also mm. had, and still has, a wonderful relationship with her own natural father. Mm. But I think that kind of bond yeah. is very special in her case, and many others, too, for yeah. women as well as Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you kind of started going down this road with the church fathers, but what's the, the place of spiritual direction in the life of the church, in our tradition, uh, in looking at the um, uh, the wealth that the churches offer us through throughout salvation history. You know, what, what, where, what place has spiritual direction had, uh, historically speaking? And I will admit I didn't do a full history of spiritual <laughs> direction in preparing the book, but uh, to give a little sketch of that, as I mentioned, the, the Desert Fathers who went out into the desert to live a monastic life, and the monastic life in general has been a real centerpiece of spiritual direction. Mm. Those men and women who are living this dedicated life of prayer and asceticism really come to know themselves and come to know their own interior life, which is really key in spiritual direction. And it gives them wisdom and a capacity to receive and love and communicate mercy to those who come seeking some guidance yeah. on a one-time basis or on a regular basis. So that was really the initial seeds of it in the church. And then I think in some intervening cent centuries, as we talked about, the enfolding of spiritual direction into confession, into regular confession, giving just little bits of wisdom, the, con the confessor not taking an hour necessarily with a penitent, but in the context of our regular understanding of confession, five, ten minutes, giving some wisdom, giving some regular guidance. Mm -hmm. 
there's a beautiful text that I also draw from, from the 19th century, the, uh, the soul of the apostolate. And Dom yes. Chotard speaks of the kind of spiritual direction he, he imagines a pastor sort of forming crack troops uh -huh. in his parish yeah. and giving them on a monthly basis a half an hour of spiritual direction mm. that keeps them going deeper in the spiritual life and helps them to integrate the, their other experiences into the spiritual life. And then they're really empowered to go out and be a force in his parish and in, and in the ministry. So there's, there's always been uh, spiritual direction. And certainly we have St. Francis de Sales and St. Yes. Joseph Cafasso and a number of saints that we mentioned in, in an appendix to the book. There's always been a, a movement, a dimension of spiritual direction in the church. But I also have the sense that in our time, there's a, a further emergence yeah. of spiritual direction, yeah. a greater desire, a greater call for it, and I think a greater need for, for spiritual directors. Yeah, that's so that book, Soul of the Apostolate, is one of my all-time favorites. And at the same time, it's a book I dread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I remember reading it for the first time, right on the time I became a Catholic over 30 years ago. And I had just discovered spiritual direction, mostly through Opus Dei. And I was just sort of like dumbstruck. It was like yeah. spiritual direction. It, this is what it's been missing, you know. Evangelicals who discovered are sort of like, um, it's, it's a hidden treasure. Yeah. And so that was one of the first books I was given to read. And it was bracing. I mean, just the emphasis it put upon roots, you know, and the interior life, mm. and avoiding activism. Mm. Uh, and it just seemed to be ideally suited, not only for me, but a lot of other people who are like me, who as evangelicals are always out there doing things, but not necessarily allowing our Lord to do things on the interior. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That, that provides, I, I think, uh, uh, an excellent segue to uh, uh, something Archbishop Chapu had written in his really quite admiring review of your book. Mm. Uh, he fingers, I think, the problem. It, it's the central paradox, really, of our time, that on the one hand, we're able to master more and more the material world, right. externality. Uh, we can know it, we can control it, we dominate it. But at the same time, we neglect the soul. The mm. spiritual life uh, has gone begging, it's impoverished. And, and what we need to do is feed the soul because we have this profound hunger for God. So would you insist that maybe everybody get spiritual direction? <laughs> I do get nervous. Are you underemployed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not underemployed, yeah. personally. Yeah. One of the reasons we wrote the book, and as Archbishop, Archbishop Shapu and a few of the other reviewers mentioned, there is such a need because there is a growing desire. Yeah. And again, I think for everybody to be in spiritual direction in a little way through the confession yeah. is, is an excellent place. But I think a lot of people would benefit from yeah. spiritual direction. There are various levels of spiritual direction, we might say, and I think there's a place for, for more. Pope Francis uses the phrase spiritual accompaniment, and he yeah. actually says the entire church needs to be formed in the art of accompaniment. Yeah. And the way he describes that is very similar to the foundations of spiritual direction. Yeah. Someone who can walk alongside, who can patiently listen, who can help a person explore their interior more deeply, and can help a person bring that before the Lord yeah. through prayer and through an understanding of the scriptures and applying the gospel in their lives. So I think to really expand that art of accompaniment, which is a, a, a pretty significant share in spiritual direction would be for everyone. Spiritual direction was a basic, permanent fixture for religious life, at least yes. that's my understanding. And so when Vatican II sort of renews this sense of the universal call to holiness, that lay people in the middle of the world are called to become saints, and not just those who are in cloistered convents or monasteries. You know, it seems to me that people who are in the middle of the world don't need spiritual direction less than people in a monastery. Right. If anything, you know, the way that secularism saps your spiritual strength, it's almost incumbent upon lay people who are serious about holiness to agree. be more intent. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, again, I haven't investigated this thoroughly, so I, I'm shooting a little bit from the hip in saying it, but in a way, spiritual direction was not an essential part of religious life. And it, uh, at least in the, in the first part of the 20th century, especially where you had so many, you had convents of 600 nuns. Yeah. Who's going to be the spiritual director for 600 yeah, nuns? Right. And oh. they really developed, it was Catholic culture that formed their spiritual life. Hmm. And in a religious setting, the religious Catholic culture, they had a phrase, you keep the rule and the rule will keep you. And the sense that that culture of religious life would keep them going 
and they had a novice mistress or a superior who met with them at certain times, but not really a, a, a strong accompaniment. There were exceptions, someone like a Mother Teresa, who really sought out a spiritual director who had exceptional things going on in her religious life and needed that kind of guidance and continual accompaniment. But the missionaries of charity even now don't all have spiritual directors. In fact, by the, the rule is that they don't have spiritual directors. Only by an exception would they have that. The structure of religious life and culture made it such that spiritual direction uh, wasn't as necessary. But I think to make to emphasize your point, I think our Catholic culture has fallen apart in such a way that yeah. Yeah. that personal accompaniment and those who are going deeper in the spiritual life can really walk alongside and help to form uh, groups, small groups, individuals in, in developing a spiritual life. Excellent. Yeah, um, I want to pick up on that point. Uh, stay with us for the next segment of Franciscan University Presents. We live in a noisy world. There are more distractions than ever these days. A lot of voices that are not of God. And I think spiritual direction is needed more than ever. Just to get an outside person to help you hear the voice of God, to kind of sift through all the distracting voices, all the temptations, and focus in on your ultimate purpose, who you're called to be before God. When God created you, he made you like no other person. You are unique, singular, and unrepeatable. So shouldn't your college experience be the same? At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ and His Church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. You'll discover lifelong friends and mentors who will welcome you, challenge you, and encourage you. Because we believe as Catholics, we are not called to hide from culture, but transform it. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself and an educational experience as singular as you are. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking with Father Boniface Hicks about his new book, Spiritual Direction, A Guide to Sharing the Father's Love. He wrote this along with Father Tom um, Acklin. Um, Father, in the last segment, um, we talked about spiritual direction and Scott brought up the point that I think I assumed as well that there, it was primarily a religious uh, a focus uh, in, in um, who receives spiritual direction. You, you, you really showed that, that that wasn't necessarily the case in the church gone by, but that our culture has changed. So who really is the primary beneficiary of spiritual direction? Because uh, I would say that I've benefited tremendously from spiritual direction as a man, a layman in the world, out in the secular world. Um, but who would you say spiritual direction is most uh, properly attuned to? And the way that you just presented that maybe gives me a chance to rephrase what we talked about just before the break, that probably the primary recipients of spiritual direction were priests and religious, but that's not to say that all priests and religious by far had spiritual direction. Okay. So really by exception, uh, lay people also received spiritual direction uh, in, in times past. And, and we see the role of the spiritual director appear many times in the lives of the saints, which I think is what Dr. Hahn was mentioning earlier or referencing. Many of our saints in times past have been priests and religious that we canonized and held up as examples. So we see the spiritual director in, in their stories, yeah. but uh, others also. Really for anybody who wants to go deeper in the spiritual life, a spiritual director can be an invaluable guide. Mm -hmm. A spiritual director helps us to explore our interior a little bit more. There's something in manifesting our interior life, which is our the way that we process reality, our thoughts, our feelings, our prayers, what's going on inside of us. And especially the more vulnerable that we become in the context of spiritual direction, the more that we're able to expose those parts of us that 
we're a little bit less certain about, that we're a little mm. more anxious about, the parts of us that seem kind of unfinished yeah. and that we're afraid to present to people, spiritual direction should be the kind of safe context where that manifestation can take place. Yeah. And the spiritual director then can help to mirror back and also shine the light of God on some of those places and help the directee bring those places before the Lord. The real danger is that we hide things even from God, mm -hmm. like Adam in the garden. Of course, we can't hide from God, but we want to, especially in the places that we're insecure about or areas of sin in our lives, that we try to sequester those and that we don't really integrate them into our life and bring them before God and allow them to be transformed in prayer. That's powerful because I mean, I led the subtitle here, A Guide for Sharing the Father's Love. I mean, yeah. ultimately, that's what you're doing in spiritual direction is you're well, well, Father, shine would, that. Love. Would you maintain that ideal spiritual direction uh, should really issue forth from a saint, that you've got to be holy uh, in order to shepherd others uh, to holiness, to perfect the art of direction? It might be nice if you were yourself perfect. <laughs> and, and do you qualify? <laughs> well, there it goes, spiritual direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right off the list. You've got to be Nobody a saint. qualifies. <laughs> well, certainly Jesus is, a, is an ideal and an example. Yeah. We, can, we can tease out some areas of the gospel where he gives spiritual direction, maybe not in the extended hour-long monthly format, right. but certainly in his accompaniment of the apostles and the disciples and the way that he touches the wounded and he draws forth by his listening and by his insight, and even gives them a chance to speak their wounds. To, yep. When he asks the man who's blind, what do you want? He gives him the chance to speak that, yeah. and then also to bestow the healing. Or the man whose hand is withered and is probably hiding it, and he says, show me your arm. And the text says, as he brought it out, it was healed. So the very process of vulnerability, oh, that's beautiful. the very process of exposing the interior becomes a process of healing in the presence of God, in the presence of love. Right. And so spiritual direction can really form that. So the spiritual director needs to be someone who can listen and listen with the heart of Jesus and manifest him as much as possible. A saint obviously is the most qualified. <laughs> there have been some discussions and uh, Teresa of Avila is often quoted, although it's not her only statement about the qualifications of spiritual directors, but she's also often quoted as saying, if I had to choose between a saint and someone who is knowledgeable, I would choose the person who's knowledgeable. Yeah. She said that in one context, but she speaks of the importance of sanctity and spiritual directors. Well, in you know, I, I, I feel the same way when I get on an airplane. Uh, I don't need a saint <laughs> to fly the plane, but That's if right. he knows how, if he's competent, knowledgeable, then I'm, I'm confident that we're going to make it. Yeah. What, what prompted my question was a line uh, in your book that, uh, where you quote uh, Pope Francis. Uh, he talks about the church uh, being a, a place where uh, the desolate uh, and the dark uh, can be shepherded. And it's good to know that you can descend into the darkness without becoming yourself lost. Mm. So that would be a mark of some sanctity, mm -hmm. uh, I should think. I mean, if, 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 if the church is a field hospital, right. then you want doctors uh, who are themselves healed dispensing yeah. the healing to others. Yeah. And one of the points that we make in the book is we believe that a spiritual director should himself be in spiritual direction. Yes. And so yeah. he's also in the process of manifesting his own darkness and his own yeah. depths. And he knows the journey also by his own experience. Yeah. Everybody's journey is a little bit different, but there certainly are, certainly are marks of commonality. Yeah. And the more that we are in tune with ourselves, also as spiritual directors, things come out in us. Your darkness might start to trigger something in me, right. and I need to be able to be aware of that and also have someone that I can bring that to. Yeah. So we just started us down a question of, of who, who ought to be spiritual directors. And, and it, you don't necessarily have to be a saint, although that's the ideal spiritual director. Um, who, who is supposed to be a spiritual director? We talked about priests earlier, obviously. Um, what does that look like? Who, can, who is qualified and or, or appropriate to be a spiritual director? Well, I believe, and as we say in the book, just very simply, a spiritual director should have a spiritual life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a spiritual director should be in spiritual direction. Yeah. And so someone who's already walking along the path, and then I would add a third, maybe obvious criterion that the spiritual director's spiritual director should think that he's giving spiritual direction. <laughs> should think that that's a good idea. Yeah. One should check with their spiritual director about whether they're qualified to give spiritual direction. Yeah. 
you know, these are all links in a chain that lead to the Father. You know, as mm. you subtitle the book, A Guide for Sharing the Father's Love. And this is why proximity to Christ is so important mm. because mm. only if you are close to Jesus can you come to know God the Father. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And in the same upper room discourse, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. Mm. You know, so fatherhood, it seems to me, in our culture has been almost entirely eviscerated or at best yeah. eclipsed mm. and distorted. And so if ever there was a time for people to kind of find the Father through Jesus, it's by finding spiritual directors who are close to Christ, who long to get closer to Christ, you know. At the same time, I, you know, the, the pilot analogy is right because you need experience, you need knowledge. Right. You know, even if you can't wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, yes, I am finally holy, you know, <laughs> which is probably not a safe thing to do for anybody, you know. And so sanctity is one of those fleeting things, but experience, life experience, and especially that sense of being close to Jesus, this is what I look for, you know. And yeah. as I mentioned before, in Opus Dei, you, you have a you have a confessor, but you also get spiritual direction from others, you know, mm. the brothers in the work. And so, just as you were describing how a community is forming people by the rule, I think there's a, a kind of plan of life as well that forms us. But that also reinforces what you said before, because, you know, in a community with 600 nuns, how can you possibly afford, you know, spiritual direction for each one? Likewise, on a baseball team or a football team, you don't have each player doesn't have his own coach. You know? <laughs> right. There is right. one coach for yes. all of the players yeah. to keep them united. You know, It really is the situation where when you're out in the world and you're feeling alone and isolated, I, I think it might be time for people who are in that situation to say, do I need a spiritual director? Right. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I baseball, I think, is a good analogy because uh, you don't want to learn the game from some guy who is bored out of his mind <laughs> uh, by, by, by how it's played. You want passion. Mm. You, and you also want competency. Uh, and that combination is a happy, rare mixture. Mm. You want a spiritual director who is passionately in love with Christ. He may not yet be a saint, but he's on the way. Right. He sees sanctity as a process. He's open uh, to further development. He, it's not a finished whole. He's broken. Mm. But he can share uh, something that he's learned on the way with this other guy who's just beginning. Mm. It, it's not really like teaching. I mean, George Bernard Shaw said, those who can do, those who can't teach. <laughs> but in spiritual direction, you need to have made the journey yeah. uh, mm. and you're struggling uh, along the way. Mm. I mean, Eliot has a great line, we're only undefeated because we have gone on trying. The director has been trying for a long mm. time and he's utterly undefeated, and he can impart some of that hope and confidence to a directee who then says, you know, you've gone pretty far along this road, uh, and you give me confidence, you give me hope that it's worth the effort. Yeah. And I think we can bring these things together again with that image of fatherhood, that the spiritual father, just like our human fathers, are not perfect, yeah. but they certainly have traveled the journey of life a little farther than we have. Right. Yeah. And they can impart that wisdom that comes from experience, but they also walk along with us. And I, I love how much our conversation has really centered around that concept of accompaniment. And we've looked at a spiritual director as someone who, who guides, but also walks along with. And I think that's really critical because a, a lot of times we get this misunderstanding of spiritual direction that it's a kind of spiritual guru who sits on the mountain right. and we come to him as an oracle to answer all of our questions and right. maybe he answers us in riddles that we take back <laughs> and try to right. live out in some strange way. And I think that, that couldn't be farther from the truth yeah. in terms of how real spiritual direction is. The, the image of accompaniment, the image of the, the wounded healer, someone who walks right. uh, alongside of a father who can help to form us and guide us are, are much more uh, fruitful and accurate images of spiritual right. direction. And I think that's key because I think a lot of people think of spiritual direction, oh, I'm going to get advice. I'm getting spirit, you know, which it may be involved in, in a spiritual direction, but it's much more about the self-revelation of themselves mm. to God and God to, to the directee, right? And so as, as you play this out, what, what does that spiritual direction kind of meeting look like? What, what, is, what is involved in it so that people get a sense of what happens in spiritual direction? Well, again, the focus of the meeting is on the interior, is on the relationship of the directee with God. And mm -hmm. so that's always what we want to aim toward. But that takes place 
in the interior. And so we're mm. going interior. And the, the directee begins to manifest experiences, relationships, dimensions of prayer. And a good director is primarily listening for much of the session, yeah. is listening. And the kinds of questions and feedback are, are to help the directee go deeper. Maybe the directee presents a situation. A good director might say, well, and what, were you, what was your interpretation of that? What was mm. the meaning that you found there? What were the feelings that you had when that was unfolding? And where was God in that? Mm. And yeah. how can we bring this then to God? And so a director teasing out uh, a lot of the interior experience, things that the directee may have processed beforehand, but many things that are revealed in the session. Mm. So the sweet words that a director loves to hear is, I've never shared this with anyone. Oh, yeah. And a good director hears that on a, on a regular basis from, from different directees, and it develops that kind of safety that really the deepest interior is opened up. And then the director is in a position to do a little bit of communication, yeah. to apply the gospel, to help a directee take these insight, in experiences into prayer, uh, ways to receive the Father's love, also by the director's own manifestation of love, his gaze, his affirmation, his encouragement. Mm. And, and beautiful things happen when the, when the directee's interior life is brought forward in yeah. that way. Mm. Mm. That's profound. This is a very different approach than most coaches. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think of Steubenville and our public high school, which has won state championships disproportionately, yeah, and how the coach strikes terror in these players <laughs> and inspires yeah. them, too, to kind of play beyond themselves. And you want to do that, but you have to do it gently mm. if, it, in fact, you're representing God and you're trying to bring about not just a championship, but that kind of humility that leads to true holiness. Yeah. Mm. So I appreciate that kind of emphasis on listening and uh, you know, representing the Father's tenderness. Well, you're, I mean, you're passion. probing an area of life which only God fully knows mm, and right, can right, see. Right. Uh, and so you have to tread gently. Yeah, mm -hmm. Stay with us for the next segment of Franciscan University Presents. I think there is a need for spiritual direction today because there is a need to see how God is working in our lives and it's, it allows for someone to come along and accompany, accompany us on the journey into the spiritual life and to help us um, not only uncover sin areas but offer antidotes in how to grow in the spiritual life and how to grow in a life of virtue, how to grow in a life of prayer and how to be able to um, overcome those obstacles that come up in prayer. The spiritual direction relationship takes time because a, a trust level needs to be developed between the person coming for direction and, and the director. The, the person coming is going to reveal their interior life and that takes risk and vulnerability and the director is always listening for the voice of God, ready to echo back the voice of God. I really believe that, that everyone is telling the story of God in their lives, whether they're listening to the voice of God or ignoring it. It's the story of God in their life and it's the job of the director to listen, to suggest some things back and to help them to hear what God is saying. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. This entire program springs forth from the very heart of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. We're taping the show right now in our communication art studio uh, here on campus. Our, our students are operating the cameras and equipment. Our panelists, our regular panelists, our theology faculty here at the university. We've been talking with Father Boniface Hicks um, about his book, Spiritual Direction. Um, Father, so, so let's get a little practical. Um, one, you know, it, we're looking as a spiritual directee, looking, looking for spiritual direction. How do I get the most out of my time in spiritual direction? You know, I, I'm, I'm biased and I'm selfish wanting to know what, what can I do to get the most out of my time with a theoretical spiritual director? Well, as we discussed a little bit earlier, the real gold t happens, comes forth in spiritual direction when we're able to manifest our interior. Okay. In that process, we discover our own interior. There's something about the revelation of it, the sharing of it, that helps us to go deeper. And as we see it echoed back, and as we receive the encouraging love and mercy of the spiritual direction, the Father's love that is communicated through spiritual direction, it gives us courage to look at those parts of our interior that are less formed or that are even problematic, some areas mm. of darkness that we can bring forth. 
So being very vulnerable. Sometimes my spiritual director has started with, and I likewise have started with the question, well, what do you want to share the least today? <laughs> Start there. Wow, wow. <laughs> and it gives us a sense of when we go that deep, then we can sort of raise up from there more easily. Yeah. But those areas that we avoid have a way of also controlling us and limiting us. But when we can open them up, then it can really be set free and brought into our relationship with God, and we can discover Him as a merciful Father. I ascribe a great deal to St. Therese's little way of holiness, mm. and it's our, our littleness that all of us have. As adult and grown up as we are, we're all little children before the Heavenly Father. Yeah. And the more that we can get in touch with those places in us that are a little more poor and little and open those things up, it does a great deal of good for us mm. in spiritual direction. Do you find uh, it's <clears throat> painful uh, for the directee, uh, at least initially, to become totally transparent. Mm. Well, and the process of spiritual direction, and one of the reasons that a single meeting is often not enough is that trust has to develop. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we don't even think of the areas that we could manifest until that trust develops. As the trust develops, as we're more confident that all we receive in return for our vulnerability is love, affirmation, encouragement, support, guidance, and the ability to bring these things now into prayer and before the God the Father, the more that we develop that trust, we want to go deeper. We want to share the most vulnerable things. We want to show those, those areas to the spiritual director. But at first, the development of trust can be very difficult. And depending on how deep the wounds are, how much we've been hurt in the past, yeah. our own relationships with our parents certainly play into these things and other significant figures priests and coaches and teachers and <laughs> right. different people that we've trusted, when we get hurt there, then we're more reluctant to open those places. And it can be difficult. It can be yeah. painful. Yeah. You know, when I think back to when I began spiritual direction many years ago, and I also think back to conversations that I've had with my kids and friends who have spiritual direction, I think the one thing that stands out for many of us is uh, we expected for them to be treating us harsher you know, hmm. more harshly in the sense of yeah. a coach, you know, because you're, you're coming in and you're vulnerable and you expect yeah. to be kind of set straight. And you, you, I wish he was tougher on me, you know. <laughs> and I find myself still wondering why he isn't tougher on me <laughs> from time to time. But I think there's a transition that has to take place gradually that you're not a convict, you know, yeah. coming clean, finally confessing. Yeah. You really are a penitent. And so it's not fear. It's not just to avoid punishment. It really has to be inspired by love and trust which is at root this supernaturally infused gift of faith. Yeah. And I think if you try to get around that and just play off the fear, you know, it might seem as though you're making progress because you're getting rid of bad habits or you're, you're instilling that kind of fear more deeply. But I, I think you're right, it's compassion. You know, I find that with our six kids, you never stop fathering. Even when they become fathers and mothers, mm. you still have to father, but you have to develop an entirely new approach because they're not adolescents anymore. They're adults, and so encouragement and listening, vulnerability on their part, but on my part as well. Yeah. I think there really is an analogy between fathering adults and spiritual direction. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it, it would seem to me, Father, that it's a pretty terrifying challenge that you face uh, in proposing to give spiritual direction uh, to someone who may be less broken than you are. Uh, and you're being sort of like God. I mean, in a good sense, you're a father, and you're leading others to the father, and you're urging them, enticing them to be open, to be vulnerable, to be totally self-exposed. That takes a lot of courage. It, it takes, I think, a certain audacity of hope to think that you can mediate a, 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 an experience that you probably need more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. You're broken. You're, you're the wounded surgeon. Mm. You know, that plies the steel. That, that's pretty intimidating. Well, and the, the comfort is that God has a more vested interest in this process even than I do. He wants this person to grow, and He wants to manifest His love. And so the willingness to stand in that place is uh, takes some courage, as you say, but also the reinforcement of positive experience is truly wonderful. And yeah. I do meet with people who are less broken than I am, and I do meet with people who are certainly, I would say, holier than I am, and who have experiences in prayer that are different than my experiences and yeah. maybe more intense or more continuous than my experiences. But above all, God is making Himself present 
through the spiritual director, and so I really have to let him be present. Yeah, what, what you're describing, I think, <laughs> is that special grace of state that you have as a priest and as a monk, as a spiritual, direct, a spiritual director. But again, it's analogous to being a father. Yes. Mm. Because I am fathering kids now who are more virtuous than I am. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. less broken than I am, at least I hope, you know. Yeah. And judging from things, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a vibrant Catholic community with all of the sacraments available. And so I really sense that God has to make up for what I lack and he has to provide them what they need through me and often in spite of me. Mm. And if I ever got up, you know, like you and said, well, finally I'm qualified, you know, <laughs> I'm virtuous yeah. enough to father them. You know, at that moment, I think my kids would duck. <laughs> <laughs> there comes incoming lightning or something, you know. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're formed in spiritual fatherhood in the process of being spiritual fathers, yeah. whether that also is a biological fatherhood or not. And I love the way that this conversation has moved in this direction. And we, we pointed out in the introduction, I think the book is helpful for fathers and mothers mm -hmm. who are in the process of being not only biological fathers and mothers, but above all, the, the spiritual formators of their children, first and foremost. Yes. First and foremost, but we're always looking for surrogates, coaches, pastors, youth ministers, teachers, professors. I mean, the more father figures in my kids' lives, the safer they are. <laughs> That's right. true. And, and it, it does take uh, a church <laughs> to That's raise right. these kids. Mm. Um, but, I, but I think that's interesting because the, the, when I read that in the book, that obviously the primary is for those who might be in formal spiritual, as formal spiritual directors. But you talked about the helping profession. You talked about parents. You talk, th th There are so many uh, different folks who can um, just realize that they are in a role where they might be accompanying somebody. Isn't that our call? Mm -hmm. you know? and, and sometimes we look as, as Catholics that we don't know how to share on a stage like a, a professor or a speecher, or speech, uh, uh, evangelist, <laughs> a speecher. <laughs> um, but, but we can all walk with somebody. We can all um, um, uh, look at this and say, you know, there is, there is wisdom that we can gain as parents and as those who are accompanying others to help them see what God is doing, to ask questions that help them just really even self-reflect. I mean, although, again, I know this is, you know, there's so much depth here for formal spiritual directors, I feel like a lot of us really can step into that one-in-one -in -one mm -hmm. role, and this gives so much wisdom uh, for us. What well, must be a whole lot more difficult now than, say, a thousand years ago, because we live in, in such a scattered age, it's dissipated. Uh, we, we don't stand anywhere, but we're blown everywhere. Uh, I, I remember a, a beautiful essay by Romano Guardini. It came out in the early 1960s on the virtue of recollection, mm. uh, which is not widely known, mm. much less practiced. But he insists that unless you are recollected, you can't really be fully alive, fully yeah. human. You have to be in touch with the inward drama, the interior life. Mm. And we're so buffeted by external stimuli, yeah. especially now. I mean, Guardini did not know about the internet. We live in cyberspace increasingly where there is no there there, and it intrudes constantly upon our lives. We have no self. Yeah. There's no there there. How do you begin to draw people to God? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and such an important point because there really is a lack of interiority. There's yes. so much superficiality and the internet, the, the, the dominant media really foster superficiality. Mm -hmm. So in spiritual direction, one of the first things that I do is to make sure that people are praying. Yeah. Just taking time in silence is so essential. And silence becomes also an element of spiritual direction. Sometimes we need some silence to enter into that one-on-one -on -one right. communication, to allow someone to go a little deeper, to get in touch with what's going on inside of them. Maybe even the fear of the spiritual director, or the fear of what they want to share, and helping them to bring out and get in touch with those interior elements. Yeah. But it's really essential. Some of the things we've talked about could flow just as easily into a counseling setting. We're talking right. about vulnerability, sharing wounds, but that dimension of prayer is really critical to spiritual direction. Well, I, I like the, uh, the insistence upon silence. Uh, it reminds me of that classic work, uh, The World of Silence by Max Picard. He, he has this lapidary line that when two people speak, there's a third person and his name is silence. Mm. And that could be God who wants mm. to speak. His word signifies, but you're too busy. Uh, you're too busy be, you know, being fed by external stimuli uh, to hear him. 
uh, there, there's too much noise and distraction. Mm -hmm. And I guess the job of the director is to try and break through mm -hmm. all of that and, and awaken a, a certain longing for silence yeah. for the other. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Which is a great reason to have uh, both a prayer life, a sanct you know, seeking sanctity on your own as a director, but also being under direction that you are accountable, that you are trying to always uh, deepen your spiritual life. If somebody wanted to become a spiritual director, wh what do they do? They, they, they buy the book from Emmaus? <laughs> well, uh, it's a good beginning, right? I, I hope uh, it's, a, it's a good start. As I said, they need to have a spiritual life and they need to have a spiritual director. And I could really add another dimension to that, which is kind of classic going back to the Desert Fathers. People seek them out for spiritual direction. Yeah. I'm always a little wary of the spiritual director who plants a sign like Lucy, you know, a nice <laughs> five cents right, and right. puts yeah. their, their, themselves out in the public square. But I think that people see the, the depth, people start to trust a person, and then the request for, could we talk more regularly? Or the, mm. do you have a few minutes and then some deep things start to come out? Yeah. I think another dimension of being a spiritual director is that someone is seeking us out. Yeah. So having done that, we might find ourselves in a position, as we already described also with fathers and helping professions, that we say, I want to learn more about this. I want to understand what are the dynamics of listening? How do I go into deeper interiority? What am I supposed to say after they do all of this sharing? How does the spiritual life develop? How does, how, do the, how does psychology play into this? And then I think we have a lot to offer in, the, in yeah. the book. That's really what we set out to do is somebody who's already almost taking a step in this process and then wants a fuller understanding of what it's all about. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's also important to recognize that spiritual direction is not an end in itself. Mm. It's a means to an end. Mm. The interior life is the end. You know, and so if you're seeking spiritual direction without really initiating or sustaining an interior life, you know, the tail's wagging the dog here. And, and so that life of prayer has to be at least a, a desire. Yeah. And I think that spiritual direction then has enough tinder to kind of ignite a flame or, or to take a spark and make it into a flame. And yeah. I think that is sort of what is also, uh, you know, there's an affinity. Uh, uh, you're, you're priming the pump. When you have a spiritual director who you know loves Jesus, mm. he'll take what little love I have yeah. and mm. ignite it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah, I always think, it, having had a spiritual director for a number of years, I, I, I remember someone saying to me, you know, look for somebody who has a, a you can tell that they have a great love for Jesus, because that's what you want. Mm, you want right. somebody who is going to help deepen that in your own life, as well as somebody who is spiritually mature, have suffered, and their faith is richer for it. And, you know, as we, as we seek out people like that to be in accompaniment with us, we really need to, if, if we, I, I think the earlier question was, do you have to be a saint to be a spiritual director? Right. I think the, the other part is, if you want to be a saint, right. you probably should seek out a spiritual director. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stay with us for the final segment of Franciscan University Presents. In working with Franciscan University students over the past 10 years in spiritual direction, it's a joy to see when the students are able to open up the Bible and to actually find God's love letter to them. When that actually comes alive for them, it's a joy to watch. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy and you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily Mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking about spiritual direction with Father Boniface Hicks. We're at the final segment, so Regis, could you start us off? Yeah, uh, Father, I can't say enough uh, good things about you and about your book. Uh, at one level, it is massively researched. Mm. Uh, I dread to think how many uh, hours of spiritual direction uh, you were prevented from giving <laughs> because you were so busy writing it, but it's a beautiful book a profound study, and you make it really inviting, not easy, but uh, inviting, uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. And I'm struck by the subtitle. I mean, you put the Father right there, front and center, 
And that's what the director intends to do, to shepherd the directee, to try and draw him closer to the father. And as we all know, the way to the father is not a roundabout way. It cuts right through the son. Mm. So the obvious qualification of a good director is someone who has fallen madly in love yeah. with Jesus and wants nothing more than to somehow infect others with that same passion. And without that, uh, it doesn't matter how many books you've read, how much of the history of the church uh, you are steeped in, you're no damn good uh, as a director. You're really a snare and a delusion. It's sort of like going to a restaurant and you see the menu, but you're not the least bit hungry. So what are you doing here? You know, go to McDonald's. Uh, you, I, I think, provide the cuisine that makes the spiritual life uh, so very tempting uh, for so many people. Let, let me just uh, uh, recall something that I came across years ago. Uh, the philosopher George Santayana, he taught courses on the Trinity at Harvard for years and years, and students marveled at how much he knew he could reconstruct the whole architecture of the church's theology of God. And one day, a student said to Professor Santayana, you know, you must really love God a lot because you talk so learnedly about him. And Santayana said, I have no faith. I've lost my faith. I wish I had it, but I'm a lapsed Catholic. I don't believe a word of it, but I've committed it all to memory, and I'm able to somehow reproduce it. But no, something is missing. I mean, that's a great pathos surrounding that kind of erudition. And so you combine, I, I think, in the book, and I suspect in your life, that happy mixture mm. of, of knowledge uh, and, and art, mm. knowledge and love. And uh, I'd almost want to become a Benedictine so that I could be <laughs> a direct recipient of, of, of your charism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Regis. Thank you. Scott? You know, the danger of professors of theology parroting dogma, yeah. you know, uh, and also parroting prayers. You know, there's a danger of pietism, devotionalism, multiplying all kinds of you know, devotions endlessly. And I think spiritual direction is one of the ways that you can kind of escape that. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I, as editor-in-chief of Emmaus, I'm grateful and proud to have solicited this, you know. But even more, as I was reading the drafts, I began to realize that I have to go back to adoration, to the rosary, to the saints who are sort of like around the table every evening when I, when I, when I go through these novenas that can all so easily become rote, you know. Uh, this book really personalizes the spiritual life, beginning with God as Abba Father, and then Jesus as the beloved Son, but as the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and Mother Mary, and the whole reality of the spiritual family that is better than any human household, you know. Uh, and, and this is why I think in the last few months, your book, as well as your own example, have inspired me, you know, in prayer. I, I, it isn't like I'm a half a mile away from heaven. You know, I'm still a zillion light years away. But nevertheless, it's like I long to make progress and to do so in a way that personalizes this sort of thing so that it's not just a professor, you know, parroting the dogmas of the Trinity for his courses or whatever, you know. But it really, you know, takes a sinner and makes him a saint, even if it is seemingly a, a series of endless marathons, you know. But thank you for writing this, and thank you for allowing us to publish this. I really believe it's going to do a lot of people a lot of supernatural good. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for those beautiful words and for the opportunity to be here. I really see in spiritual direction an opportunity to personally apply the kinds of insights that both of you have written about and explored from scripture and theology and have shared with the world in such wonderful ways, but they need to be applied personally to our lives. Mm -hmm. And a spiritual director can has the opportunity to do that. As a directee opens the heart and entrusts their heart to him, the spiritual director can really help to apply those truths and develop that deep personal relationship with God that I'm not just one in a multitude that God looks at from time to time. So many misconceptions about God that people carry around with them uh, all over can be corrected gently, reformed, and, and transformed in the context of spiritual direction. And I'm so hopeful that more men and women will respond to a call 
to do that kind of accompaniment, uh, whether in a kind of formal way that they would fashion themselves spiritual directors or as parents, as we've discussed, or even in a form of mentoring and teaching, even in friendships, uh, even among married couples. Many married couples that I know who are very open and close with each other can give themselves a kind of spiritual direction. It shouldn't be the only source, I think, but, but there can be a real mutual support that's there and helping us to personally apply the insights of the gospel and our relationship with God to our own personal lives. Yeah. So I think the, I hope that the book is helpful in uh, giving people some courage and some ideas of how to do that more effectively and that it will lead to a, a, a renaissance of a deeper spiritual life among the faithful that will enliven our parishes and bring people out of the pews a, in a sense to really encounter God and then to share those treasures with others. Thank you, Father. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's program, we do have a handout for you. It's a section from Father's book on spiritual direction. You can get it at faithandreason.com, or you can um, uh, just call us and we'll, we'll send it off to you. Um, I have I've enjoyed uh, and benefited from spiritual direction for um, almost 30 years. And uh, as a high school student, I thought that I had a call into the priesthood. And so it was discerning, what does God want for my life? Uh, later on, as I stepped into uh, marriage and family, it was a spiritual director who helped me. I felt very inadequate uh, stepping into that role. Um, we all have this universal call to holiness, um, but, but how do we apply it in our specific, unique situation? Um, and a spiritual director has been that uh, accompaniment for me uh, throughout these years. And uh, I know I wouldn't be half the, the person I am today without a, a guide, without somebody who's walking alongside me, drawing me deeper into the Father's life love. Um, and that the power of this uh, is unleashed in our families and in our apostolates and the way that we serve. Someone who keeps us in check and who drives us deeper into the heart of the Father. Uh, so really everybody can benefit on some level. I really want to strongly encourage you, if you can't find a spiritual director, pray for it. Seek out other uh, priests or religious who can help you, even your bishop or whoever. Um, there, there are so many great resources that we need to tap into because this is, this is what discipling looks like. Like. This is what being mentored uh, by an older brother or sister in the faith uh, so that we can really latch on to our own unique way of responding to the call of Christ. Um, I want to invite you to be a part of Franciscan University's mission. Um, our mission is to educate, to evangelize, and send forth joyful disciples. And we want to equip you for that, that journey, uh, maybe by coming here uh, uh, to Franciscan University, to our campus in Steubenville, Ohio, to get your degree, or to go online and take one of our online degree programs or certificates. Or join us at our summer conferences, a dynamic presentation. Often our, our guests and our, our panelists here, our speakers at our summer conferences or join us on our spiritual pilgrimages as we travel throughout the world to holy shrines and sites or come to faithandreason.com to be equipped and encouraged to share the faith and, and lead in the new evangelization. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.